But let us start where, where we are. I mean, we are clearly in the very early days of a mega crisis of a nature we have never seen before. I remember two months ago, uh, sounds like an eternity, uh, quite a number of us were at the Munich Security Conference. And if we um, try to remember what was said then, hardly anything, except by the Chinese, was said about the coronavirus. Attention was all over everything else, but not this. And since then, in two months, we have entered what we might call the great global lockdown. The EU economy, if you look at what the IMF said yesterday, would contract by 7 to 8% this year. That's huge. The US economy with 6% or so this year. That's huge. The economy is diving down with greater speed, significantly greater speed, than due to the great financial crisis. And the IMF predictions of yesterday for next year, they swing optimistically between a bounce back of 6% and a further 3 to 4% contraction of the global economy. It is, of course, first and foremost, a health crisis. People, people's lives are at stake. And it's likely to linger around as a health crisis longer than I think many predictions today when it starts to hit the huge nations of the emerging world. And it will happen. It will indirectly affect us as well. But it's also, of course, an economic crisis affecting people's livelihood and is bound to lead to political tensions. It looks, if we look back on Europe, we seems to be hit by a storm every five years. I mean, 2010, it was the Greece and the Euro crisis that erupted and consumed everything else for a number of years. And five years later, in 2015, we suddenly had the refugee crisis. And that turned, as we remember, most things upside down for quite some time. And now, five years down the line, we are two months into this crisis. But to predict details of what is going to happen is as futile as it would have been to make certain, very certain predictions just two months into the great financial crisis or just two months into the refugee crisis. What we learned from those two previous crises is that they normally last longer, they upset more, and they leave more difficult legacies than we think at the beginning of the crisis. So where then should we start, apart from the obvious immediate health and other priorities that are occupying political leaders? I think we should start by recognizing what is obvious to all of us. This is a global crisis. Uh, and it hits what uh, we used to refer to as the liberal global order, uh, when that is already under fairly severe strain of what we've seen in the last few years. It is really the first great crisis of the post-American world. Uh, the UN Security Council has been nowhere to be seen in this particular crisis. The G20 was very important in the global financial crisis. is headed by a somewhat erratic prince in Saudi Arabia. And the Trump administration has, of course, been preaching America first and everyone alone for years and is now practicing that. The only thing that is really globalized is the virus. And that's, I think, where we have to start. We will see, and Mark alluded to that, those wanting to put borders and barriers everywhere in a vain effort to protect us, to go back in time and try to believe that nationalists were going to protect us. But even if you go back to the 14th century, when we had the Black Death, it didn't prevent us from being hit. It might have taken somewhat longer time, but it was even more devastating in those times. So we must think of building up global systems to fight what is a global challenge. The virus can't be stopped in just one place. It has to be brought into control everywhere. Otherwise, nowhere will be safe. And here I believe perhaps EU could take the initiative. The, EU, the US is clearly not even interested. When they're cutting funding to the World Health Organization in the middle of the crisis, it shows that for the White House at the moment, fighting China is more important than fighting the virus. And China can hardly take an initiative either. It has a rather dubious record in the beginning of the pandemic. It doesn't have the credibility of these issues at the moment. 
uh, Europe was aiming at taking the global leadership role on the green global issues, the climate issues. But now the COP26 has been postponed. Emissions are probably going to go down this year. And uh, other issues obviously have the priority. So perhaps Europe should be prefer itself on offensive on the global health issues. This could also be a way to try to rescue or perhaps uh, restart an amount of multilateralism. It would also demonstrate to Europe that really feels global responsibility in a period when no one else seems to do it. And there are quite a number of issues. Help to fragile countries before they collapse. Shoring up the financing of the World Health Organization. Intensifying scientific exchanges. Making certain that the vaccine that hopefully comes is manufactured rapidly and distributed across the globe at affordable prices. Setting a better warning system for the next pandemic that is bound to come. The green issues will remain. They will come back, but they might not be the priority at the moment. You remember in Munich, Joseph Borrell, the new high representative, made headlines by saying that Europe must develop an appetite for power. And that, in my opinion, remains true. But at the moment, the priority is to demonstrate an appetite for survival. There will be severe internal tensions, and they must be overcome, although that is beyond our discussion today. But it's also a question of helping our neighborhood, as usual. If the Balkans, if North Africa, if the Eastern Partnership countries sink down in divisions and despair, feeling abandoned by everyone except China, that spells significant trouble for Europe further down the road. Perhaps Turkey and Ukraine merit special attention. And they could also become more important to Europe being supply chains if there's a need to relocate further down the road from the manufacturing dependence that we have on China. A mega crisis of this sort normally accelerate trends that we have seen before. That's normally the historical pattern. And um, a more assertive China, yes, we've seen that. Uh, we see now that he's clearly seeking to extend the reach of his powers in the different ways that we have been experiencing in the last few weeks. A more disruptive the United States, clearly, the new decision on the World Health Organization can be seen as just the latest manifestation of something that we unfortunately are likely to see more. It is obviously retreating even more into itself. You might argue that everyone does it, but this was a country that once aspired to global leadership. A more digital world was also a trend that we had before. And that is, of course, accelerating by leaps and bounds. And here, Europe was struggling to find its position on these issues, and that will be even more important as we now move ahead. And if we talk about uh, accelerating trends that were there before, there's also, of course, a severe risk that it will accelerate the decline of the global relevance of Europe, because that is, let's be honest, something that we've seen in the last few years. But it, that is not unavoidable. In every crisis, there lies an opportunity, and our task, EFSIA, must be to help Europe find those opportunities. We weren't really created this organization for plain sailing, but also for being able to master storms. And in a situation where the Americans are retreating, the Chinese are losing some credibility, although asserting their powers, there should be room was uh, a more globally responsible and responsive Europe in the months and the years ahead. So that's just some reflections, Vessel, on where we are. Thank you very much, Carl. It seems that all of our thinking from the past is even more relevant now than, uh, than before, uh, from what you're saying. But we have also an internal debate within ECFR whether Europe is failing uh, in its response, how uh, successful or unsuccessful uh, it is seen to have been or to be currently. Uh, what is your take on that? How do you think uh, Europe is doing? Well, I, I left that aside because that is sort of, we are European foreign policy, I used to say, not 
European domestic I know, policy. I know you love <laughs> yeah, that the, question, but no. I think it's crucial um, in these times. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I sometimes have reason to reflect on the difference between Italy and Sweden when it comes to attitudes on these issues. And Italians um, are very sort of disappointed with the European Union at the moment. They have a tendency to have, a, they have an overbelief. They believe that the European Union can sort it out every single issue in Italy and elsewhere. It can't. Uh, Swedes are the other way around. Uh, Swedes tend to underestimate the significance of the European Union, and we've seen both of these tendencies at, at work here. Clearly, um, EU was struggling in the beginning, severely, uh, because to uphold the single market is among the most important things, and they are still struggling with that. I think it was a great disappointment to see France and Germany both imposing uh, severe restrictions. I mean. Swedish firms were developing uh, medical equipment for Spain and Italy. We couldn't get it through France because they confiscated it on the way. And it required sort of severe political interventions on the highest level to get the lorries passing France without being confiscated. I, I think things are slightly better, and I hope one has learned that particular experience. Then one has lifted all restrictions, of course, on state subsidies and, and deficit spending. That is necessary, but the road back from that is not going to be easy. And then we have the ongoing discussion on the economic support programs, uh, which I think we can leave outside this, but uh, uh, there will, of course, be sort of massive economic effects. Of this. I, I think there's also been now a greater realization in Brussels of the necessity to do a helpful thing to, to the neighborhood. Uh, there were export restrictions on medical equipment that hit, for example, the countries of the Balkans and Ukraine, uh, which was unfair. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't know if they have been lifted, but I've been informed that they will be lifted anyhow. Um, so it was mixed bag. Um, but that is usually the case. Um, Europe was not prepared for the Euro crisis. Europe was not prepared for the refugee crisis. Europe was not prepared for this crisis. And uh, it is now a crisis management mechanism. And if we think about this new world in which um, all of the good and bad trends from the past are enhanced, who do you think is going to win the battle of narratives, as uh, the EU high representative put it uh, recently? Who is going to come out as uh, as the winner of, of of this crisis, or are we talking about actually um, a, a landscape of relative losers? I think we are talking about a landscape of relative losers, but even if, if, if that is relevant, I don't think the Americans are going to win it. Uh, I, I think that's fairly obvious. I think the Chinese understood that they were about to lose it, and they are trying to catch up. And, and, and do quite a lot of things. Whether that will succeed, I think, is debatable. Europe remains to be seen. I think if you look five years down the, the road, uh, or even further, much will be dependent upon how the respective blocs have managed the, uh, the, 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 the economy. Uh, because, of course, the big shift uh, that has been happening is the growth of Chinese economy and the Chinese power that stems from that. And uh, if that continues, uh, yep, then the Chinese will be in this. Can the U.S. revive the economy? Can Europe uh, prevent itself from going into lengthy slump? Um, five years down the road, I think that's going to decide very much. Soft power comes from economic strength as well. 